to our fourth July Lecture in Physics 2013, celebrating the discovery of the quantum atom by Niels Bohr 100 years ago. It's my enormous pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, my colleague Professor Rachel Webster. Uh, Professor Webster has had a stellar career in astrophysics. Uh, starting uh, she, she came to us after a uh, PhD at the uh, University of Cambridge and postdocs in uh, Canada at the University of Toronto. Joined us in 1992 and started from scratch a, an astrophysics uh, research group here at the University of Melbourne, which has since become one of the uh, leading uh, astrophysics research groups in the country and is now part of the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for All Sky Astrophysics. Uh, Professor Webster has had a distinguished career at the University of Melbourne. She won the inaugural Nature, Nature Mentoring Award in 2006, and if you search YouTube, you'll find a video from her explaining the importance of mentoring for developing the careers of students, and many of her students have now gone on to leadership roles in astrophysics around the nation and around the world. Uh, her research uh, focuses, amongst other things, on some of the uh, precursors for the square kilometer array, and I, was, I think it's not an exaggeration to say she took a leading role in delivering uh, the square kilometer array, an important part of the square kilometer array, to our nation, which is one of the ma uh, most important scientific research projects in the 21st century. And the focus in that work is on the topic of tonight's lecture. For her accomplishments, she's been inscribed onto the honour roll of Victorian women, and appropriately that was done in 2009, which was the International Year of Astronomy, celebrating Galileo's invention of the telescope 400 years earlier. This year, she was awarded the Robert Ellery Lectureship, uh, by the Astronomical Society of Australia, which is uh, an award that goes to uh, a, a scientist who's made outstanding contributions to astronomy. Uh, Ellery was uh, uh, director of the uh, Melbourne Observatory in the 19th century. Uh, but in uh, Professor Webster's spare time, she is also the deputy president of the academic board here at the University of Melbourne, which is the main decision-making body in guiding uh, the affairs of the university. And she is also a tireless uh, innovator and she had pioneered uh, a new breadth subject in the Melbourne model at the university on the introduction to climate change, which is now annually taken by many hundred uh, undergraduate students spread across uh, arts and science. And that uh, subject she is now taking into the brave new world of massively open online courses, so you too can enroll in that in the future. So it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Rachel to the stage. Well, thank you very much, David. And uh, I certainly didn't know I was on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> you learn something uh, every time you do one of these lectures. So tonight, um, Tonight I'm going to talk about hydrogen, which has been the topic of the lecture series, uh, or the July lecture series this year. And I'm sure most of you know that uh, hydrogen is the major component of the universe, uh, and indeed in the early universe uh, there are essentially no elements heavier than hydrogen and helium. During this talk what I'm going to do is trace the history of hydrogen from the time that it formed, from its very beginnings, at the time of a time that we call recombination, and I'll explain what that is, through to the present day. And uh, just at the end, I'm going to discuss some of the uh, recent experiments, or at least they're not recent, they're current experiments that we've just started, uh, and uh, explain to you um, exactly what their importance is in the evolution of uh, hydrogen in the universe. <coughs> so let me just start with some sort of preliminary uh, comments to set the scene. Uh, the universe started out as about 75% of hydrogen. But when I say that, that's of the stuff that we understand. <coughs> um, there's other stuff in the universe that we don't understand, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. But of the stuff that we 
we understand 75% of it is hydrogen. During the course of history, uh, the universe's history, some of that hydrogen has been transformed into other elements. And some, some of the hydrogen has ended up in your favorite objects, stars, planets, and black holes. And what, what I'm going to do is just give you, you know, trace through uh, how, how in fact that happened. The second thing that I want to uh, just uh, introduce is that it, obviously hydrogen is the simplest atom. It occupies the first place on the periodic table. Uh, and it comes in three forms, or basically in three forms, in the universe. And I, I want to introduce these terms because I'm going to use them a little bit uh, during tonight's lecture. And, and so <coughs> I want you to feel comfortable uh, with the way I'm going to talk about hydrogen. But hydrogen can be in atomic form. It can be an atom. And astronomers call this H1. Uh, don't try and understand why we call things by the names that we do. But anyway, H1 is the atomic form of hydrogen. And we can detect this reasonably straightforwardly because uh, when the atoms are excited, I'm going to explain what that means, uh, they can absorb and emit light. And it's the light that we detect. Now the second form of hydrogen is as an ion. Um, that's without the R. And what happens there is that the uh, electron gets stripped off, and so you're just left with the proton um, or, or the ion, and basically we can't see that. Um, so if there's a lot of that out there, um, we sort of have to deduce it's there rather than uh, actually see it. But there's a third sort of hydrogen uh, that is also quite common, um, and unfortunately that is also very difficult to detect. And that's also called H2, of course. Um, although you can see it is written a little differently. It's an H with the two downstairs. And that's actually a molecule. So in other words, it is in fact uh, two hydrogen atoms stuck together. Uh, uh, but it's a pretty fragile uh, um, molecule. It only forms when it's very, very cold. And by cold here, I mean temperatures like, you know, yeah, below 100 Kelvin or something like that. So we're, we're talking really very cold. And it's fragile. So if you bathe it in almost any sort of light, if photons uh, you know, enter the cloud, uh, then it'll break it apart and you'll go back to having atoms. Okay, so, um, and I'm not going to talk a lot about uh, the molecular form, as I say, basically because we don't see it very much, but we do in fact know it's there because that's the form of hydrogen that's the precursor uh, to actually forming a star. So when we form a star, it goes through this phase, it, it forms the molecular hydrogen first, and then um, it uh, becomes much denser and, and forms the star. So what we can say, though, is that essentially the history of the universe is a history of the formation, the gravitational contraction, and then the transformation of hydrogen. And that's basically all it is. So, you know, if anybody wants to tell you it's more complicated. <laughs> Actually, one of the things I should say is, of course, hydrogen is also, uh, it's not a gas that you can see. Um, and uh, in the words of one of our uh, would-be political leaders, have said that it doesn't exist. <laughs> anyway, for this evening, we'll assume it does. Now, I'm going to start right now at the beginning of the universe. And you're not really, I know that the writing on this is uh, quite small and difficult to read, but I'm just going to explain uh, the key features of this. And uh, it, it's here to really show you that there was an in the beginning for the universe, right? And the in the beginning, as far as physicists are, or, and astronomers are concerned, is back at uh, 10 to the 43 seconds, right up the top here, minus 43 seconds. Now this is an impossibly stupid time. Um, I don't think any of us can even start to imagine what 10 to the minus 43 seconds means. But at that time, the temperature of the universe was 10 to the 32 Kelvin. That's also completely silly. Um, but, you know, these, these are not numbers that, um, well, they, they don't even make sense uh, to astronomers. What they do make sense to, though, is some of the formulae that we can write down. And we can actually write down some physics that does make sense up until the time of 10 to the minus 43 seconds. And basically we call that time the Planck era. And beyond that time, in other words, going back earlier than that time, 
quantum effects come into play and basically the physics that we understand ceases to make any sense of the universe. Um, so, so, so that's really the limit of our understanding. We then go through some uh, periods, these are called the gut era, the grand unified theory era, um, the electro weak era, era and so on, and, and that's all in this phase here, there's something called inflation, we're not going to go through all of that, um, but we get to 10 to the minus 10 seconds, still an impossibly short time, but it, this is the time when particles start to form. So things like quarks form, uh, protons form, antiprotons form, and eventually electrons form. So at, through this time here, when the temperature is around 10 to the 15 Kelvin, we, we actually get the building blocks of the universe forming. Okay, so the next thing that happens after that is that some of these fundamental and elementary particles get together and they start to form slightly more uh, complicated um, uh, uh, units. So for example, some of the protons get together with a neutron, or, or a couple of protons get together with a couple of neutrons, and they form a nucleus of a helium atom, for example. And during that time, a few other uh, uh, nuclei form lithium, a little bit of, tiny bit of lithium, tiny bit of boron, will form during this era. And it basically forms because it's really hot. And so the sort of chemical reactions uh, that the, they're called nuclear fusion reactions, really, but those nuclear fusion reactions can proceed because it's hot enough. But all through this time, the universe is expanding, and as it's expanding, it's obviously cooling down as well. The temperature is going down through here. And eventually we get to a point where it's no longer dense enough because it's expanding, the density is going down, the temperature is going down, and so these nuclear reactions stop. Okay? And that's um, at about five minutes. So when the universe is five minutes old, we've sort of frozen in the sort of fundamental nuclei uh, that we're going to have to play with at the beginning of the universe. It's still a billion degrees Kelvin, so it's still kind of warm in there. Um, but uh, anyway, the universe keeps on expanding beyond that point. And during this period in here, what's happening is that light, or photons, are interacting with the electrons in particular, being scattered by the electrons, and uh, you know the uh, nuclei are bouncing around. We often call this a sort of soup um, of um, energy and matter. Um, but as the universe keeps expanding, it gets the, the soup becomes more rarefied and it cools down. And then we get to this critical point down here. Now we're now at 3,000 Kelvin, and this is actually a number that we can start to appreciate. Uh, we know that the surface of the sun is about 5,800 uh, Kelvin, so this is cooler than the surface of the sun. It's sort of almost within, you know, things that we might understand. Um, and the universe is actually now getting quite old. Well, for me this would be quite old. You know, 380,000 years old. So, you know, quite a lot of time has passed. Now a very critical thing happens, happens here, and that is it is now cool enough for the protons and the electrons to get together and form a hydrogen atom. And that's exactly <laughs> what they do. So this, if you like, is the birth of hydrogen at this point here. Now, something else very important happens at that time as well. And that is because the electrons and the protons get together and they form an atom, all the light that is bouncing around in here can no, no longer really interact very much with those atoms. And so the light that was trapped and the soup here now is free to actually flow through the universe. Okay. Um, and it does. And uh, what we see today is some light from this period actually has a black body, um, black body uh, spectrum, and uh, and it's been uh, it's been what we we call redshift. It's basically been stretched out by the expansion of the universe, and it is now at three degrees Kelvin. What that tells us is that the universe has expanded by a factor of about a thousand since that time, but we can still see the imprint of that time um, you know, if we look up in the night sky. Now, just to sort of further set the scene, so if we go back to that time about 300,000 years ago, I probably should have written 380,000 years ago, so forgive my imprecision here. Um, so this is the time of this microwave background. This is what the sky looks like at that time. This is an image of the whole sky taken with a satellite that we call WMAP. Um, and it's, a, it's an image uh, of 
basically of a three degree black body. So the peak is in the, in the microwave part of the spectrum, so it's a, it's a radio map. And the whole sky is quite a big map. This is the center of the galaxy in here. And there's tiny little fluctuations, about one part in 100,000 in the temperature on the sky back at that time. And what those little fluctuations tell us is that the matter was actually a little bit more dense in some places and a little bit less dense in other places. Okay? And because of that, the places where it was hot and where, where it was more dense, you know, the matter was compressed. When you compress matter, it gets a little bit hotter. And so you see these little regions here. Now, when we found this, when we first saw this image, and it was 19, it was about 1992, there was enormous excitement. And the reason for that was that we knew that there had to be little fluctuations in the density of the matter back at that early time. And the reason is really quite simple. We exist here today. And if we look at the density of the universe today, compare it to the density here, we're in an incredibly dense environment. So somewhere, somewhere way back in time, the density, had, there had to be a little over density that would grow, that would collapse, and would eventually warm all the, all the stuff that we see in the universe today. We're going to walk through that a little bit. But let's go back up to here. So um, I've got this funny little diagram here, and it's got three little things on it. And so you'll see that two of them are, are, are quite large at this time. There's this big yellow arrow, and that's representing dark matter. And there's this little red arrow, and that's the ordinary matter. And the ordinary matter at this time, remember, is hydrogen and helium. Okay, so that's the stuff that we're made out of, to first order. The dark matter, there's five times as much of that back at this time, and um, I, I know a lot of you will have heard a bit about dark matter. We actually don't quite know what it is. Um, you know, our particle physics friends have been struggling with the problem that we've given them for some years. They haven't yet come up with a solution. They will get there in the end. But we can tell them quite a lot about it, okay? It gravitates, it, uh, and, and, and it basically uh, controls how uh, this ordinary matter is going to behave, as I'm going to explain in a moment. Now you'll see that there's another little arrow up here, um, which is yellow, um, which is basically non-existent at this time, when the universe is about 300,000 years old. But if we fast forward now, and we move on to, to today, when the universe is about 13.7 billion years old, so we've come forward quite a bit in time, you'll see that the dark matter and the you know, ordinary matter you know, the technical term is baryonic matter, but we'll just call it ordinary matter, have sort of remained the same, okay? They, they're, they're less dense because the universe is a lot bigger, but they're, they're sort of in the same ratio. But this guy here, the one that had almost disappeared back at that early time, has exploded. And the reason for that is because this stuff here, which is called dark energy, behaves in an entirely different way uh, from the dark matter and the, and the ordinary matter. So dark matter and ordinary matter, well, you know, they gravitate, they, they have mass, um, they interact with light, although the dark matter obviously doesn't interact very much with light, otherwise we can see it. But this dark energy stuff doesn't behave like that at all. It doesn't gravitate, okay? It, um, in fact, it does exactly the reverse of gravitating. So instead of wanting to be pulled together, um, you know, one part of it pulling, uh, you know, gravitating towards another, it in fact uh, wants to push things apart. And instead of becoming, you know, basically as the universe expands, the ordinary matter, um, you know, the volume gets bigger and, you know, so the density goes down for ordinary matter because, you know, density is mass divided by volume, volume gets big, density goes down. But this thing here, it, it doesn't behave like that at all. In fact, it just keeps um, on you know, the density remains the same. So it's just as dense uh, now as it was, um, you know, a factor of a thousand uh, times, you know, back um, in the universe. So this, this is very extraordinary stuff. Now, what does this dark matter do? Well, it actually dominates the, um, the dynamics of the universe today. Uh, and and I'll, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about that in just a moment. I just look, I, I couldn't resist putting this in. I hope um, there's been a lot of discussion about this image in the previous lectures, but it's you know truly remarkable. I was going to have a little picture of hydrogen trotting through my lectures, and then I discovered 
uh, that uh, just a couple of months ago, in fact, we have the first image of, of really of the, uh, it's, it's a quantum image of the hydrogen atom. Okay, so um, let's actually look at um, how we allocate mass in the, in the universe today. Uh, then 75 or 74% of it is dark energy, and the dark matter is 22%. <coughs> And then down here, about 4% is the ordinary stuff, the stuff uh, that we're used to, uh, the hydrogen and the helium and the slightly heavier elements. And so you can see things have changed enormously from that first time when hydrogen was born through to, through to today. Okay, so let's just have a look and see what dark energy does, and then we're basically going to get rid of that and concentrate on, on what the rest of the, what the other components in the universe can do. So dark energy actually dominates the rate of expansion of the universe today. So the universe is expanding, but one of the questions that we've had for a long time is, um, you know, is that expansion um, accelerating? Is it decelerating? Um, what's happening? Um, you know, you know, what will be the fate of the universe into the future? And this is the sort of little series of diagrams that we've always had. You've got the beginning down here. I never can figure out why they have this explosion because it didn't explode, but anyway, I guess it's pretty on a picture. And then there was always these three possibilities. The universe is expanding, and then it contracts again. The universe is expanding, and it keeps on going forever. Or it's expanding, and um, it, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's getting bigger as it goes along. Very recently, just in the last 10 years, we've added this guy over here, okay? He wasn't on the diagram 20 years ago. But you can see it's really quite different because what's happening is that the universe is actually, the, the expansion is accelerating. So the universe is getting bigger a lot faster. But there's something else very important as well about this model of the universe. And that is, um, so, and of course, just to be convinced that's the right one, but what's really important about this one is that it actually allows the universe to be a lot older uh, than any of the other models. And so if we have a, a, a plot here of time, okay, and this is the average distance between galaxies because we're looking at an expansion, you can see that the one that was on the left here is, you know, it starts here, it goes up and then it collapses down again, but it's quite a, this is now, okay, and, but it didn't have a very long history. Whereas this guy here, this yellow one, is the accelerating one, and you can see it goes back, and, it, and it's about 13.7 billion years old. Now, this guy here is only 4.4 billion years old, and that's not even as old as the Earth, so that was never going to work, okay? We kind of know how old the Earth is, and so we needed to have something that would give us enough time for all the, you know, rocks and, you know, bits and pieces that we know are in the universe to, to evolve and, um, you know, to form and evolve. On this plot here, you can see the data as it stands at the current time. And you can see why astronomers are pretty convinced that the yellow line is the correct one. And of course, um, I, I know a lot of you will have heard um, uh, talks about this in particular by Brian Schmidt uh, from ANU, who um, in fact won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago um, for his contribution to collecting um, some of this data and setting up these experiments. Okay, so basically we've got dark energy, um, but it's, it, it, it doesn't really affect our story about hydrogen. Um, it, it, it sort of will a little bit into the future, like, you know, 10 billion years into the future, but into the past it really didn't make uh, very much difference, and today it doesn't make very much difference, because the dark energy is quite smoothly distributed, and all it's affecting is, this, uh, is the accelerating expansion of the universe. But um, there are two key bits of physics that we do need uh, to, to uh, get hold of how hydrogen is going to be made. And the first is um, we need to know a little bit about the structure of the hydrogen atom. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure all of you have been to the previous three lectures, and so you're going to know exactly what I'm going to tell you, but just in case any, there's, there are some people who didn't attend, I'm going to say a little bit about the structure of the hydrogen atom. And then the second thing that we need to know about is gravity and how gravity is a, a, affect uh, the evolution of hydrogen. We'll, we'll talk that through as well. Okay, so this is a, a, just a bit of a cartoon about how the hydrogen will, will get. 
uh, from Astoma. And uh, it's not as pretty as that quantum image that we had of the hydrogen atom. By any stretch of the imagination, this is a bit simpler, uh, but it gives the fundamental ideas. And so we've got the nucleus in here. Um, and in fact, that's just a proton. Okay, so it's sitting in here at the center of our atom. And then we've got this yellow thing here, and that's the electron. Okay? And in, in, in these models, these ball models, um, the orbitals are just drawn um, as lovely circles. And so there's a ground state, n equals 1. There's a slightly higher energy state, at n equals 2. We can go up in energy, and we get n equals 3, and so on. And at some particular point out here, um, if, if the electron is moved far enough away from the proton, then it in fact uh, separates from the proton and we say that it's ionized. Now, if we move the uh, electron between these two states, the energy, the energy uh, difference between these two states is quite well defined. It's, it, it's, in fact, it's extremely well defined. And um, we, if, if the electron moves from here to there, that energy is transformed into a, um, a particle of light or a photon, and that photon is emitted. And because that is such a precise energy, when we see that photon, we know exactly where it's come from, what the transition of that electron is going to be. And similarly, if the electron is sitting here and uh, it, it, it absorbs a photon, or it absorbs a particle of light, then it will jump from this energy level up to this one here. But it will only do that if it's precisely the right um, uh, photon, exactly the right energy uh, for it to make that jump. Now, in the hydrogen atom, there's a whole series of possible jumps uh, that the electron uh, can make. And, uh, you know, astronomers get to know and love all these, uh, all these jumps. And, uh, and in particular, for example, um, the jumps, so there's n equals 1, there's n equals 2, but the jumps from or, and into the n equals 2 um, energy level are particularly um, we're particularly keen on, and you can see why immediately if you look at the wavelengths of these uh, lines, these are in fact called the Barma series, and it's because they all fall in the visible part of the, of the uh, spectrum. So in other words, it's light that we can see. Okay, and so if we go out with our telescope, then we can quite likely see uh, this line, this 656 nanometer or 6560 angstroms, we can see that line in a spectrum. And so we can, we can spot it out and we can say, oh yeah, there's hydrogen there and we can understand what's going on. So the Barma series, all these jumps, um, in fact, as you can see here, um, all, um, they're getting more and more energetic, but they're all sitting in the visible part of the spectrum. Now, the jumps from the n equals one part of the, um, of the electron uh, levels are, uh, are called the Lyman series. And these jumps are in fact more energetic than the Barma ones, and so they all fall into the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. And one of the important things that the Hubble Space Telescope has done is has been to um, see quite a lot of these lines in more detail, so we've become more familiar with them. Uh, there's one uh, very important one, uh, which is uh, the longest wave of the uh, which is called Lyman Alpha. So these, these lines, they're not only called by the numbers, the names of some very famous physicists, but they're labeled alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and so on. And then there's the passion series, which are in the infrared, and astronomers have just started really to, to get um, uh, uh, infrared telescopes that can make the observations that can see these lines. And in fact, I have to tell you that I got some time on the Gemini telescope uh, just recently, I have a new infrared imager or spectrograph on that telescope, and in this last week, I've got a whole lot of um, passion lines in a quasar that I've been wanting to study. Um, and so, uh, so you know, this is a uh, these are new lines for me, but very exciting. Anyway, so these are the lines, uh, if you like, and and in some ways you can sort of think of these lines. I call the atomic DNA. When you see a line that has this very, one of these very precise wavelengths, you know exactly which atom has given it up, because no other atom will have precisely the same um, energy levels. Okay, um, oh, and, and just to finish off, um, so that's of course the cartoon of the Bohr atom, 
But um, as I'm sure most of you know, um, the hydrogen wave function, if you actually solve it correctly, the, the orbitals don't look anything like those pretty little circles, they look more like this. Um, and so they're, they're actually, these are the probability distributions uh, solving uh, the Schrodinger equation. Uh, but you can see they have uh, much, much more um, interesting shapes. Uh, physicists are able to represent these in, in a much more interesting way. Okay, so that's, that's the, the basics of the hydrogen atom, and those are the signatures uh, that we want to be able to look at and to use to track how hydrogen is going to behave. Now, <clears throat> of course, this would all be very boring if hydrogen just kind of you know, sat around and was smoothly distributed throughout the universe, nothing much would happen. <laughs> and so we now need to get a little bit of dynamic behavior going in the universe so that we can actually make things happen and make changes occur and, uh, and allow the universe to, to evolve. And the way this happens is just under gravity. It's just pure and simply gravity. And so, of course, what happens is those little um, regions that are slightly more dense that I was talking about at the beginning of the lecture, the regions that are slightly more dense, they start collapsing under their own weight, and then at a particular point in time when the collapse um, you know, start, you know, gets past a critical point, it will speed up, and then the collapse will happen extremely quickly. And so regions of over density will start to collapse down. So we start here you know, at about you know, half a billion years universe, half a billion years old, and then the, the more dense regions collapse down, you get these wonderful filaments forming, and, um, and then all the activity, all the action that we're interested in is going to happen in these very dense regions. So let me just show you, I've got, you know, no astronomy lectures complete without some little movies, and so this is, this is the sort of movie that astronomers have been making uh, for the last decade or so, to illustrate how things collapse, how matter collapses um, in the universe. Now, the matter that you're seeing collapse here is actually not the hydrogen, uh, because remember we said that there was dark matter in the universe, and then there was uh, the normal matter, and the, the, the normal matter is only it's less than 20%, uh, it's probably about 15% of the dark matter, so it's really not very significant. And so what these simulations in fact represent is the collapse of the dark matter in the universe. But because you know, these regions are now regions of enhanced gravity, the hydrogen gets caught up in this process as well. So as the dark matter collapses, it takes uh, the uh, normal matter along with it, and so even though this simulation is representing dark matter and the collapse of dark matter, into those dark matter um, uh, you know, sort of gravity holes, if you like, uh, you, you will, you will find, you'll find those uh, collecting all the hydrogen in the universe. And so if we take an, a, an example like this, this is a slightly different simulation, it's a slightly later one, um, then you can take a region like this here, where the dark matter has collapsed, and then you can blow it up um, and uh, look at it in more detail, and then blow it up again, and you see something like this, where this the, the white, or sorry, the yellow um, parts of the dark matter, and into that into that region, uh, we'll get a lot of hydrogen formula. Okay, so um, so what happens then? Well, of course, this collapse process is we, we we believe that these clouds don't just collapse, but they collapse and fragment at the same time, and so you get little raisins, if you like, uh, within these clouds that form, uh, that, that collapse faster, um, and those are exactly the locations where we might expect a star to form. And our belief is that the very first stars that formed in the universe may have been extremely massive. Um, and there's a very strong reason for believing that. We could, we could have just thought that the stars that formed back then so this is in the universe, it's just got hydrogen and helium in it. We could have sort of just thought that they might be just like our sun, so they might just be kind of ordinary stars. But there's, there's one really crucial thing, and that is that these stars have to live out their life very, very quickly. Because we see things back in the very early universe, 
that tell us that a generation of stars has lived and died. And I'll explain a little bit about that in a, in a moment. So the only way a star can live quickly, you know, much more quickly than the sun, is if it's incredibly massive. Okay? So if it had the mass 100 times the mass of our sun, then it might have lived out its life in half a billion years. Our sun will take 10 million years to live. But, you know, a very massive sun might have gone through its complete life cycle in half a million years. And the sort of, um, so the sort of scenario that we have then is that we've got this dark matter collapsing and forming, um, we call them dark matter halos, and then in the dark matter halos, we get the hydrogen now collapsing and forming stars, um, uh, the very first stars in the universe. Now, if, if well, and, and, and we kind of have to be right about this, these stars, once they live out their life, uh, they, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, they go through a process of nucleosynthesis, the hydrogen, uh, they burn hydrogen, they burn very brightly, the hydrogen turns into helium, the helium turns into oxygen, and so on. Uh, the oxygen turns into, you know, goes through a series of steps and turns into iron. But all the while, as the star is, is uh, fusing uh, the uh, elements together to form heavier elements, it's, it's actually collapsing at the same time. And the temperature and pressure inside the star is going up until it gets to, 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 to a point where the core is iron and that process stops. And uh, of course, if you've got something that's very heavy, it's got, you know, the, the, it's no longer producing energy to hold it up, then the whole thing collapses and then um, it, it explodes in something called a supernova. Now, it's, it's the occurrence of these supernovae which is the critical part of the story. Because once these stars blow up and, uh, and spew out all of the um, elements that they've been manufacturing in their cores, those elements are then spread out in the gas clouds um, around where the star's been living, and then the whole process starts over again. Okay? We've polluted the gas cloud with oxygen, we've polluted it with carbon, we've polluted it with iron, not a lot, but enough. Um, and so the gas cloud that we now start out with start forming a new generation of stars that actually has iron in it, has carbon in it, that has oxygen in it. And if we look at our sun, we see all of those elements in it. And so what we know from that is that our sun can't be a first generation star, okay? It has to be a second generation star at least, or possibly even a third generation star. It has to have been made after a number of other stars have polluted the environment. Uh, that, 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 it, that it was formed in. Okay? So that's why we believe uh, that there was a, ge a generation of very massive stars early on. Okay. So, oh, so let's just uh, go through those steps then. Uh, so the, this formation of these very first stars, we think uh, they maybe lived for 100 or maybe 200 million years. These are very, very short times um, in the early universe. And apart from uh, the fact that they uh, spread a whole lot of uh, heavy uh, elements into the universe when they exploded, so carbon, nitrogen, silicon, magnesium, iron, and so on, um, when they went supernova, um, they also, while they lived, they also put out an enormous amount of, of light, an enormous, enormous number of photons, and they were very hot photons, so um, UV photons. So that's very important, we're going to talk about those in just a moment. So they, they put out um, photons, and, and those are going to affect the universe in the part where they live. I'll explain how that works in a minute. They're very massive, so they've got short life times. And then they're spewing out all of these heavy uh, metals uh, into the universe um, around them for the second generation of stars. And of course, you know, just as an aside, that, that these heavy elements are kind of important, remember, because you know, in that second generation of stars, in the third generation of stars, around some of those stars, planets form. And on those planets, just occasionally, we get life. And life, of course, needs carbon, it needs oxygen, it needs iron, it needs calcium. And all of those things have come from a supernova explosion <coughs> sometime, you know, you know, 13 or so billion years ago in our solar neighborhood. And I know, I, I, I've said this, on occasions before, 
But just remember, every one of those atoms in your body that isn't hydrogen or helium, you haven't got too much helium, but you do have a little bit of hydrogen, but every other atom has actually gone through that supernova, um, that, or at least, at least one supernova that has in our local neighbourhood. In fact, we're probably all quite related here because we've probably all come from the same supernova. So, maybe there's a small chance of that. Okay. <laughs> oh, look. The other um, image that I've got here, just to show you, is um, this is about the most massive star that we know of at the moment. It's called Eta Carina. It's about 100 solar masses. And, you know, I always think this is stunning because it looks nothing like our sun, okay? This is a very massive star. And the issue here is that it is, it is, it is pumping out so much light that it's actually having trouble holding itself together with gravity. So our sun is held together quite nicely by gravity. It's a nice round ball. But this one is pumping out massive amounts of light in all directions. And so you can see it looks like it's just about to explode. Okay, which it may be. Uh, we don't actually quite up. But it certainly doesn't look like a nice um, fuzzy round ball uh, the way our sun does. So this is the sort of star that we think, um, or, or indeed heavier ones than that, maybe even a thousand solar masses where it occurred in the early universe. <coughs> okay, so this is a, a somewhat complicated uh, picture, but I think it's actually it's sort of helpful to put it all on one page. And, and I was I was at a conference last week at Uluru. Um, you know, it, it's, it's very rough being an astronomer, and a colleague of mine there um, showed this image, and I thought fabulous. That's the one I want to pinch for the the July lecture next time. And she was good enough to give it to me. But anyway, here we go. So, so this is this is how we start out. We've got a cloud of dust and gas and molecules. We call this interstellar matter. Okay, and then we we can start to form. Um, what we call polar stars or stars being born and then um, those stars live out their life um, and then they, they start uh, move into a late evolutionary stage which we call a red giant and then depending on how massive they are they might either go supernova down here okay um, and the supernova will spew gas out which goes back into the gas cloud if they're a bit less massive they become a planetary nebula and then some of that gas goes back into the interstellar medium, or they might just expel gas that goes back into the interstellar medium. And then <coughs> after they die um, as supernovae or as planetary nebulae, they come down into the graveyard here and they become white dwarfs or neutron stars or black holes. Okay, so that's that's the death of a sort of you know moderate sized star. But also out of here, of course, around these protostars, planets form. And those planets, of course, are the, the sites that we go looking for life. So this is the sort of processing cycle that we have for stars. And you can see it's driven by gravity. So here's the collapse process here. And then once stars light up, you've got nucleosynthesis, you've got the fusion of hydrogen into more uh, complex elements, into heavier <laughs> elements. And ultimately, when all of that fusion stops, uh, the star goes through one of these phases, depending on how massive it is, and it spews all the heavy elements that it's made back out into the, into the interstellar medium, and the cycle starts again. Okay, so <clears throat> this is just a, a sort of little cartoon to show you <clears throat> how we go about making those new elements, okay, from, from, from hydrogen. And so this is, you know, there are, there are many, many uh, possible uh, fusion uh, um, reactions that we could have uh, in, in these chains. And this is really the simplest one. And so what happens in the first step is a proton and neutron fuse together to form something that we call deuterium, or heavy, heavy hydrogen. So there it is. And then the, you, you can get uh, uh, two deuterium uh, nuclei fusing. Uh, to make um, hydrogen 3 here, okay, and expelling something out here, and then the hydrogen 3 fusing with the deuterium to make uh, helium 4, so the helium 4 nucleus. And so, you know, it's, it's these sort of, there are, as I said, there are many of these um, sort of chemical chains uh, that will build up uh, the nuclei of, 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 of atoms uh, from hydrogen. Um, and, and of course, the end result out of that is the periodic table, okay? And all of the ones uh, 
down to iron. Um, we can essentially generate in, uh, in our supernova. Um, and then the ones past iron, so the ones in, so there's iron there at 26, and the ones in this later part of the table require other processes, uh, you know, slightly more complicated processes, but still essentially processes where you're fusing uh, together um, uh, different uh, particles uh, to make a, a heavier element. Okay, so this is a periodic table. I'm sure you've all seen this, probably sat on the walls of your uh, science lab uh, from the time you went to high school and gathered dust. Um, and you, um, if you ever looked at it, uh, uh, well, you know, those sort of things just tend to sit there and you never look at them. But anyway, um, there's a lot of detail in there describing um, uh, all of those different elements. But there's, a, there's actually another way that we could represent that, um, which is, you know, um, it could actually look like this if we put the little boxes at the same, you know, in proportion to how much of the stuff, that stuff there was in the universe. And you can see, really, the universe is hydrogen, it's helium, and then down here, um, we've got carbon, uh, we've got nitrogen, we've got oxygen, and then everything else has basically disappeared. And that is to just say, um, you know, the part of the universe that we live in, where we've got lots of carbon, um, nitrogen, oxygen, and lots of other heavy elements, is a very atypical place. If we actually look at the whole universe, that's essentially um, what we're looking at. All right, so let's, um, let's just have a, a quick look then um, at how we see hydrogen today. Um, I've already said, uh, talked about uh, the hydrogen atom and emission and absorption lines, and this is indeed uh, what an emission spectrum looks like. We get those very particular lines as the H alpha line, and, or we can uh, sometimes set an absorption. But just very quickly, I want to show you how what hydrogen looks like in the, in the, in the local well, in the, in the universe today, this is actually the sun imaged in H alpha. Now, the sun's basically a big ball of hydrogen, and so we should uh, be able to see it when we look in H alpha, and indeed we can. So it's a very, very beautiful picture. If you go and look um, on some of the um, satellite websites, so far and so on, you'll see magnificent pictures of, of the sun, but this one's in hydrogen. Okay, now the other main place where we see <coughs> hydrogen is in galaxies, and these are composite images, but if you actually look at the blue in these images, not the purple, um, which, which is slightly different, but the blue part is actually atomic hydrogen. And so a lot of galaxies have quite a lot of atomic hydrogen in them, okay, as you can see from these images. And indeed, uh, this particular study has, um, you can see all the different shapes, all these red things are in fact atomic hydrogen, in galaxies of different different shapes and different structure, you can see they're quite varied um, and, um, and and quite um, well, quite interesting actually. Some people like having this as wallpaper. Okay, but what I want to actually think about. So we've been talking about the hydrogen that condensed into stars and galaxies, but I actually want to think about the, the hydrogen that didn't condense into stars and galaxies because that turns out to be really uh, rather interesting. So. <clears throat> Let's go back to the time when uh, the proton and the electron got together to form hydrogen. And remember, this is, um, this is the time of, uh, we call this recombination. And you can see what's happening in here is that the light is bouncing around and it's interacting, it actually mostly interacts with the electrons and the, um, the nuclei are sort of uh, just going along for the ride. But then uh, once the electrons join, uh, with the protons and with the uh, helium nuclei, we have neutral atoms, and now the light can just travel through the universe. And that's how we see uh, that cosmic microwave background. Now I'm running out of time a bit, so I'm going to move it a little bit faster. Um, so the, in this diagram here, this is occurring at this point here. Okay, so back in about 300,000 years. And we know the universe looks like this today, and we have things like the Hubble Space Telescope and Gemini. Gemini, we can look back, and the Keck telescope, we can look back in time, and we can look back um, to about the first billion years, so about this time here. But at, at some particular point in time, a very important thing happens. The neutral hydrogen that was formed back here um, actually absorbs light. And if you like, that neutral hydrogen puts a blanket across the universe. And so as we look back, there comes a point 
where this world, well, not just physical, but ultraviolet light can no longer get through because the neutral hydrogen absorbs it. So it's why, um, well, as I say, it's like having a blanket over it. And we call that period the dark ages, basically, because it's pretty tough to get light through there. And so that tells us something very interesting. It tells us that the, the, the hydrogen that didn't get soaked up into the stars actually, um, in, in, in this late, late stage of the universe, is, is, is ionized. In other words, the early stars must have broken all those hydrogen atoms apart again, um, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to see the stars at any distance at all. And indeed, we believe that that's exactly what happened. Um, neutral hydrogen is actually opaque. We, we, we can't see through it except um, at, you know, at, at very particular wavelengths, but we can't see through it in the optical particularly. And so this is a little simulation that shows an opaque universe. And this is basically looking at the universe at a, you know, it's a, about a quarter of a billion years old and we're coming forward in time and you can't see anything, okay? We believe the universe looked like this. But what's going to happen is that a star is going to turn on. There it is. There's another one. And those stars put out photons, they put out ultraviolet photons, so these are quite energetic uh, particles of light. And that light breaks the hydrogen atoms apart again. And so the hydrogen becomes ionized. And remember I said you can't detect ionized hydrogen. So the hydrogen's still there, but it's now back as protons and electrons. And as more stars form, you get these cavities or holes in the neutral hydrogen. You can see them all starting to form. Okay? And the physics of this time is actually quite simple, quite straightforward, which is why the theoreticians are able to simulate this so beautifully. But um, this, this is moving forward. At the moment, we really, the most distant objects that we're sure that we can observe are at about this distance. And you can see the universe is starting to get a bit hollow. But in a few seconds, Essentially, there's going to be enough uh, photons in the universe to actually blow all of that neutral, all of that atomic hydrogen away, and suddenly the universe is going to become transparent in just a second, and we'll see through it. And there it is, voila! And that's the universe we see today. Okay. And so what's happened is that the neutral hydrogen uh, that was there at the time of uh, cosmic, um, at the cosmic microwave background has now been reionized. Um, it's still there, but it's been reionized. Okay, let's just, I'm going to move on uh, a little bit more quickly because I'm conscious that, we'll, you know, it is Friday night after all, and you know, even if I love this stuff, you know, I know um, I, this is, in some ways, this is not a very helpful diagram, but it's a theoretical model of what those holes in the, in the hydrogen should look like. I'm not sure it's covered because it's, it's work done by Stu Wyeth, who's, who's one of the professors here. So this, is, this was very important work because what it showed is that there should be holes in the hydrogen where those first stars form. Okay? And because hydrogen is such a nice atom and, and, and it emits photons, we can actually see those holes in hydrogen. Okay? Um, in, in hydrogen emission. And, um, and, and indeed, this is the experiment, this is the experiment that has got a lot of us excited for the last decade. Could we actually, um, could we actually go back and image the universe in the dark ages? Could we find these holes in hydrogen in very long wavelength hydrogen? So we're now looking at a, an emission line of hydrogen that I, I, I didn't actually put up in the high ground, but it's the 21 centimeter line of hydrogen. Um, which is a spin-flip transition. It's obviously a radio wavelength, 21 centimetres, starts out like this, but if we go back to the point in time uh, when this occurred, these would now be two metre long radio waves. And could we find, could we actually see the holes where those first stars form? So this is the experiment that we've been trying to do. And to do it, obviously you need to observe in the radio. And so what we decided, to, and, and, and at two metres, uh, two meters is basically the FN band, okay? Um, there hasn't, prior to, the, to us thinking about these experiments, there haven't been any experiments at those wavelengths for about 40 years, okay? Because the FN band, who wants to go and start 
you know, trying to study. I mean, you, you know, you, you don't want to pick up Triple J, you know, when you're, when you're supposed to be looking at the universe, you know. Um, anyway, uh, so, so what we did was we talked very hard about this. We worked out what the sensitivity would be required. Um, we worked out what the best place would be. And the best place is obviously somewhere where Triple J doesn't usually draw the dust, which is um, out in the Australian desert. And so um, a, a bunch of us, um, and so this is a bunch of Australians uh, and a bunch of Americans uh, from MIT, Harvard, and uh, Washington, a few other universities, Raman Research Institute in India, um, and uh, a couple of New Zealanders. We decided we'd build a telescope that would do this experiment. And we're not the only ones who thought we would do this. There's a couple of other groups who are trying to do this as well. And the extraordinary thing is, I mean, we basically had the least money, but we're now right at that point in time where we're all completely or pretty much neck and neck um, on whether or not we can do this experiment. So our experiment is set up at a place called Bilardi, which some of you may have heard of. It's where it's the Australian SPA site. So we went to a site which was going to be well serviced. You can see these are photographs that I took um, last year. So we're flying over the Bulwadi site. This is ASCAP, the, the telescope that um, uh, uh, CSIRO is building on the site. So each of those is a little antenna. This big white building here is where the supercomputer that we've put out in um, this place is. It, it, we're, we're 350 kilometers from Geraldton, northeast of Geraldton in this location, just to give you some idea of where we are. Like the, the, the Shire of Murchison, which is where this is located. Uh, it's the size we love telling our, our Dutch colleagues who are our competitors in this experiment. It's, it's the size of Holland, the <laughs> Dutch Shire. And there's 130 people. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so it's a great place. Um, you can see the roads and everything else. Um, and um, I'm just going to show you some slides because you know that's a good way to finish up. The this is the headquarters. Um, this is where, where the astronomers and the people who are constructing the telescope live at Bulati. They're donors, um, aka tin sheds. But they're actually quite comfortable, I have to say. I've stayed out here. Um, and you get your own you know, bathroom and toilet, and you get a nice single bed and stuff like that. Um, but the site is truly magnificent. The, the station is very old, as you can see from this. This was taken at dawn, so it's a bit dark. You can see it was dawn coming up. This is what the ASCAP antennas look like, and there's a very uh, fancy instrument up at the focal point of these. Um, they're called PAFs, um, but they, it's a bit like, it's like a radio CCD, if you can imagine it. Um, and this is a new, very new technology that's been developed by CSIRO uh, for radio astronomy, so that's very exciting. Um, but, of course, the one I want to show you, that's one telescope that's on the site. The one that I care about is our one that's going to detect the first stars, and that looks entirely different. So this doesn't look like any telescope you ever saw. Um, these are called tiles. This is chicken mesh. Um, this is, uh, we call these bow ties for obvious reasons. This is about four meters by four meters. There are 16 of these on the, on the ground. A lot of very um, enthusiastic undergraduates built these um, during their vacations. Um, so that's what we do with our undergraduates when they, uh, well, in fact, when they get back. You can see the, the landscape is truly beautiful out there. And we have 128 of these tiles, we call this a tile, scattered around the landscape. Okay, this is what they look like. This is a, um, this is a beam former, so this is some of the electronics that goes with it. We just roll it out in the desert because there's nobody out there, and so, um, you know, it sort of survives. There you can see, you know, a tile here, a tile there, a tile there, and so on. So they're scattered out over about three kilometers, okay? So it's covering quite a large area. And, um, and what we do is we then take the signals um, uh, along uh, optic fiber, and we take them to the control hut that's actually in the center of the ASCAP array. So it's about you know, five, six kilometers away. And that's where our supercomputer is. And we correlate the super signals. Now, this looks like a very simple telescope, which it is. Uh, it's an interferometer. Um, and uh, you may think, therefore, this is uh, just a simple problem. But the difficult part about this experiment is the amount of data that comes off it. And so if we run this telescope now for an hour, 
we get one terabyte of data. Okay? Now, some of you will know what a terabyte is, and that will sound like a lot to others of you. We've just been awarded 400 hours, observing hours on this telescope between now and Christmas, and we will get one petabyte of data that we have to analyse. One petabyte of data. Now, to, I can stand here and tell you quite categorically, I have no idea how we're going to do this. I'm probably going to need a lot somewhere along the way. But it's a huge amount of data, and that's just the data we get in the first six months. So there'll be another six months after that, and then another one after that. But just to show you that this telescope is not completely crazy, um, I'm going to show you two of the big images that, we've, that were made in the first week. So we turned this telescope on three weeks or four weeks ago. Um, so it's now running. Um, and, you know, this is half the sky. So this telescope sees 600 square degrees of sky at a time. It's just truly massive. And this, this is Fornax A. These are huge features in the southern sky. And uh, you can see lots of radio sources. They're not stars, they're radio sources. And here's another image here um, of the same thing. So these are just massive, massive images of the southern sky. And, you know, the telescope takes data every half second. Um, and then we collect that data and we have to do something with it. But anyway, I was just um, musing that I think it's about three or four years since I last gave a July lecture, and I expect, I firmly predict, that on a three year time scale, I will come back and I will tell you whether we've detected the first stars in any of this. So thank you. Uh, Yes. Yeah. 
I was surprised at the start of your lecture, I don't know much about the dynamics of this gas cloud business, but you mentioned that in these vast clouds, uh, molecular hydrogen is quite delicate, and I think it makes about 100 degrees Kelvin or more, breaks it up into atomic hydrogen. I think under normal conditions, that we're talking about thousands of degrees before that will happen. Well, it, look at... SCP or in the lab. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the hydrogen will break up for two reasons, right? One will be temperature, right, where, where you basically have collisional, uh, <coughs> collisional um, interaction that breaks it up. The other is if a photon of an appropriate um, energy comes along and that will just break it apart as well. But basically, that, that uh, molecular hydrogen only exists in pretty cold environments. Could you give us some estimate of the, the percentages of uh, what's this atomic and what's molecular out there in the universe? M m most of the hydrogen that's out there is, is in the ion mass core. Why not? But most of it is ion mass, yes. So, um, so it's probably, um, well, roughly 4%, so let's say 3% of the universe is hydrogen, so 75% of that of the <coughs> matter. And uh, the neutral hydrogen is about, um, it's about one part in 10 to the five. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's including stars, obviously, just in the gas. Stars. No, that's, that's just in the gas. That's just, just in the, in the gas. gas. That's not counting the stars. Oh, okay. okay. So, so, um, so, it, so most of it's actually in, in the ionosphere. Mm -hmm. So it's quite important. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, maybe, oh, okay, we'll take one further question okay. before wrapping up. Uh, I think actually the gentleman down here had a question, or not? Okay, maybe. Quite a bit. In the letter jacket. Um, look, there's, there are very explicit predictions about uh, how much lithium and, um, and, and a couple of you know, the other slightly heavier elements you would find um, under, uh, you know, you know, in universes of, of, um, with, with different um, you know, cosmological characteristics, okay? Um, has that been solved? The, the, I mean, the, the error bars on those measurements have come down very substantially, and, and they are essentially all consistent now. Okay. So, um, but some of those are quite difficult measurements to make because uh, you know some some of those um, elements are, are destroyed in stars. So you have know, quite a pristine environment where you can measure those elements is quite difficult. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that is the uh, conclusion of our uh, celebration of quantum atom, uh, the centenary of the quantum atom. But um, we do have uh, one more um, lecture uh, this year uh, for you. Um, let's see if I can... Yes, there it is. Uh, so actually next uh, Friday at the time of um, 6.30 p.m. back here, uh, we hear a, a visiting uh, fellow, the inaugural Lavery Foundation fellow, Professor Kate McPhee from the University of Edinburgh, is going to talk to us about um, what has biology ever done for us. So you're very welcome to come back and enjoy some refreshments uh, afterwards on that uh, next Friday night if uh, you're interested. So uh, let me uh, thank uh, Professor Webster for a, a very interesting uh, lecture. It's always great to talk to someone who I uh, think so big that 200 million years is a mere trifling uh, passage of time. Uh, again, thank you for coming.